Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the Green Schools Conference for day two. We are super excited that you are here. The numbers keep climbing. So for those of you that were here with us yesterday, thank you for returning. For those of you who are here for the first day, welcome. We are super excited for you to be here. I want to take this time to thank the team from the Center for Green Schools and the USGBC events team and the Green Schools National Network staff, the Conference Steering Committee, as well as all of those individuals who have helped um, screen and put together this amazing platform and program for you. Please welcome, add something to the chat, chat and let us know where you're from. Like I said, the numbers keep growing, so it'd be great to see where everybody is from. So, since our last gathering in Portland, um, a lot has happened. All of us have pivoted, flipped, turned, squirmed because of so many different events in the world. This open session is gonna pull those together for us. The first event occurred just after our Portland conference as the inequities in our schools were laid, laid bare as we witnessed how under-resourced our many of our community students and teachers were to make the shift to distance learning in yes, this 21st century. While we've made progress, we still have miles to go. The second event occurred as the murder of black people at the hands of those sworn to protect was laid bare by the 11 minute video recorded by a brave young woman, Darnell Frazier, documenting the murder of George Floyd. Through the summer, fall, and winter, we witnessed the failed response of our healthcare system to support the physical and mental health needs in communities that have been historically abused and neglected by that healthcare system. On top of these social dynamics, we witnessed record-breaking wildfires, heat waves, and hurricanes in the United States and beyond that caused many not just to pivot, but to evacuate and migrate from to find new homes. As the death toll of the pandemic mounted, fires blazed and climate events escalated, most people huddled in their homes. But the realities of the unjust and unsustainable world we've created are very difficult to hide from. So in spite of the pandemic, many of you marched, in spite of the pandemic, many of you raised your voices for justice. In spite of the pandemic, record numbers of us voiced our concerns on our ballots. And in spite of the pandemic, all of you teachers and leaders in our K-12 schools rolled up your sleeves to meet the needs of your students, not just the academic needs, but the physical and emotional needs of them as well the needs that shape whole human beings, the needs that allow a person to feel seen and to be heard, the needs that allow us to develop a sense of belonging and a sense of place. And that sense of belonging and sense of place helps us to take action to defend our community and our planet, which in turn leads to hope. Action brings hope. Joining together, whether it be face to face or screen to screen, we find each other. We find hope in each other's eyes. We find hope in each other's stories. Attending this conference brings us hope. We have come to be inspired, to feel like we belong, to be heard, to be seen, to know that we are not in this fight alone and to find courage to continue this work. Creating an equitable and just sustainable and sustainable future is hard work. We cannot do it alone. We need each other. So here we are, not to rest on our laurels, but to learn to do more and to do more effectively and to do more efficiently. At the board of directors meeting in Portland last year, the Green Schools National Network embraced a new vision, a vision that is designed to help us be more effective and more efficient with our own time and resources. We changed our message 
from all children attending a green, healthy, and sustainable school to all children attending a healthy, equitable, and sustainable school. It may seem like a small change, but in fact, it has been monumental. With one stroke of a pen, we planted ourselves smack in the middle of the intersection between, the intersection between equity and the environment. With a new strategic plan to put our vision into reality, we're not resting on our laurels. With the help of our school and district partners, we have rewritten our green print, now the green print for healthy, equitable, and sustainable schools. We will continue to build our nationwide network of exemplary schools and districts, but we become more clear that the system's change work to create the future we desire needs to be faster and more efficient than ever before. In a world where the terms green and sustainability are seen as a screen and campaign to protect the environment, the Green Schools National Network is stepping out to say that we cannot have a sustainable future without educational and economic equity in our communities. We believe that ed educating for a sustainable future is no longer is an, an option. It is an essential necessity. This, this means that re Thinking schools so they address the inequities in our society is part and parcel of educating for a sustainable future. The whole school and whole district sustainability shifts outlined in our new green print provide a framework for all educators to see how they can transform their schools and districts so students become change makers, not just te test takers. Students who graduate prepared to live and lead us into a sustainable future. By listening to and learning from our network partners, they have helped us to understand that systemic, systemic change cannot be done in one classroom or in one after school program. They have taught us that a system wide interdisciplinary and interdepartmental focus on both equity and sustainability is necessary to empower students staff and leaders with the knowledge, skills, and mindsets to steward their schools, their communities, and our planet. We are not backing away from the division in our society where local school boards and state legislators can cast aside critical race theory or the 1619 project. Our network, your network, is made up of students, faculty, and staff who have lived experience of systemic inequities and racism. We choose to lean into the conversations and to support our teachers and leaders in understanding the importance of listening to multiple perspectives and seeking answers to the most pressing questions of our time. Equity and the environment are intertwined in our work as we create schools that are preparing our students for their future. Students in our schools today will be the decision makers and leaders of the 22nd century, not the 21st century. They will be the ones who in turn shape the 23rd century. Yes, seven generations forward. This work takes concerted effort over time led, a led by a passionate and committed group of people. Our partners are a part of that committed group of people. You are a part of that group. You are a leader in the movement that has voice and you have a hand in creating health, healthy, equitable and sustainable schools. Schools that provide a place of mental health and well-being. Schools where faculty, staff and students can thrive. Schools that steward their financial and ecological resources in tandem. But most important of all, schools where all students develop the knowledge and skills exemplified by the plenary of panel of students you are about to hear. I'm excited to introduce this amazing group of young people who will be sharing their views on climate change education and equity. Earlier this year, the conference team opened up nominations for youth representatives from various environmental councils and leadership groups to bring a new perspective on the relationship between sustainability and equity to this conference. Uh, the upcoming presentation has been designed by these 10 young people, nominated by EcoRise, Earth Force, and Earth Echo. Be ready to be inspired by their passion for integrating equity into their work as climate change activists. 
Take it away, Ben. Um, hello, my name is Ben Del Negro, and I am a rising 10th grader in Alexandria, Virginia. I have a strong passion for environmental justice and youth advocacy, so I can't wait to speak to you all today on these topics. Hello, my name is Bridget Barron. I'm also a rising 10th grader in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, and I'm an advocate with and founding member of a student-led organization called Standing for Tomorrow. Hi everyone, my name is Jaya Kasaraju and I'm a rising junior in high school from San Antonio, Texas. I'm currently a summer intern with the San Antonio Office of Sustainability and EcoRise and I'm very excited to be here today. Hello, my name is Nicole Romero and I'm an incoming freshman at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas. I'm currently interning at EcoRise and I have my passions regard environmental justice and equity. Hi, I'm Mylea, a junior in high school from Texas and an intern for EcoRise. Hi, um, I'm Paloma Jimenez and I'll be a freshman at George Mason in the fall. Uh, most of my experience and work focuses on the environment, human rights and equity. And I'm also an intern with um, EcoRise in the San Antonio Office of Sustainability as well. Hello, my name is Ren. I am a rising senior in San Antonio, Texas. I am passionate about combating racial inequity in the climate change movement and living a sustainable life. Along with a few of my peers today, I am a summer intern with EcoRise and the San Antonio Office of Sustainability. Hello everyone. My name is Vibhavi Sankara and I will be a senior at Health Cares High School located in San Antonio, Texas. I am passionate about environmental justice and how it connects to the climate crisis. I'm very excited to be here with you all today. Hi everyone, my name is Sadie. I'm a rising senior at Stanford and I serve on Earth Echo International Youth Council. And Veronica was not able to join us for this presentation, but she did put in lots of work with all of these folks. She's a rising 10th grader at T.C. Williams High School in Alexandria, Virginia. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. So you should be you should be seeing a poll. The question is, how much climate change education did you receive in your K through 12 school? Did you have lots of education, a moderate amount of education, a small amount of education or no education whatsoever about climate change? So once you all start answering those polls, we'll get those results in and then we'll discuss. Oh, wow, 53% of you said no education at all during K through 12. 1% said lots of education. Wow, okay, small amount of education, 41%, and a moderate amount of education, 5%. Well, that's what we're here today to discuss how we can incorporate climate change and learn about climate change in schools. So while over half of the U.S. population believes that climate, climate change is real, 63% um, um, to be exact, only a mere 8% of those Americans can accurately explain what it is. Um, that leaves a whopping 89% of U.S. Americans um, like misguided. And while this may explain why 68 or 86% 6, of U.S.-based teachers support teaching climate change, um, but only 42% of teachers actually teach climate change. Um, the most common reason why teachers don't teach climate change in their classroom include the belief that it doesn't relate to the subjects they teach, um, students being too young to understand or not having the necessary education or materials to teach those topics. Um, additionally, only 27 states, as well as DC, effectively address climate change in their curriculum. Climate change education is absolutely necessary to the success of our survival. Per the UN's Youth Envoy, 84% of the staggering 1.8 billion people between the ages of 10 to 24 in the world agree that they need more information in order to help prevent climate change. It isn't as though these individuals are lacking information because they aren't affected, as 73% of youth surveyed say they can currently feel the impacts of climate change. 
A large part of the reason that so many young people want easy access to information on this issue is because while almost 90% of youth believe they can make a difference in climate change, a mere 90% of all youth surveyed have the confidence that the world will act quickly enough to make a difference. To help put that into perspective, nine out of every 10 young people believe they can influence climate change, but only one out of every 10 believe the adults around us will be able to fix this issue before we inherit it. The success of our survival also depends on the advancement of equity across the globe for all marginalized people. We already know that certain marginalized communities will be most impacted by the effects of climate change. For example, according to Princeton University, more than 50% of people who, who live close to hazardous waste are people of color. Additionally, the life expectancy of people of color is drastically shorter in comparison to white Americans due to the disparities in the climate environment and systemic inequalities. But while, these but while these communities will be most impacted, they are least represented in the climate change movement. In order to bring more equity to society, marginalized communities' voices need to be further uplifted in the climate movement. More education and outreach are necessary to prosper diverse spaces for perspectives, representatives of our population, and create inclusive and, and effective solutions. With a diverse representation, there's hope for a truly innovative and inclusive climate movement. While climate education will help young people learn more about the issues and make choices to reduce their contribution, it can also help advance equality. As mentioned before, low-income communities are often neglected when climate policies are discussed and they are not represented when strategizing solutions. This means that the people most impacted by and contribute the least to climate change don't have a say in the um, conversation of mitigation or preventing further damage. If the people in these communities were to receive education regarding the climate, they would take a stand and help their neighborhoods. In addition to this, climate education encourages people to use their voices for issues around them, which is a vital life skill. School is mandatory for everyone in this country until a certain age, regardless of background. So if climate education is taught in classrooms, students from every community can fight against climate change, environmental, social, and racial injustices. By educating more people on these issues, the climate change movement will be more representative of diverse voices. With more diverse representatives in the climate change movement, perspectives from more communities will be considered when creating policies. Climate education is essential to bringing equality to all communities. To demonstrate the value of diverse representation in the climate change movement, we have each prepared a narrative about the catalyst to our activism. Hi, my name is Jaya Kusaraju, and this is my environmental justice story. In ninth grade at my high school, the International School of the Americas in San Antonio, Texas, my biology, world geography, and English classes joined together to prepare us for a debate about environmental issues, a United Nations climate change conference simulation. I was chosen to represent Greenpeace, which supports reducing greenhouse gases, and had to argue our point of view at the climate change conference. For six weeks, we learned about the science and history behind climate change and worked to construct a speech for the conference. This simulation taught me about the complexity of this issue and to recognize multiple global perspectives from developing countries like Tuvalu to big oil companies like ExxonMobil. Since that experience two years ago, I have studied AP Environmental Science, joined the Mayor's Youth Engagement Climate Council Initiative, and participated in a Facebook Live with my local news station for Earth Day. I now know that without learning about environmental issues at my school and being a part of the United Nations Climate Change Conference simulation, I would not have learned these lessons or explored my role in fighting for environmental justice. Many of my classmates would argue that the preparation for the United Nations Conference was a lot of tedious work. But reflecting on that experience, I realized that without that crucial step, I wouldn't be as excited for my future and current role in environmental justice. I hope more schools continue to provide educational opportunities like the ones I had to encourage students to be activists like me for the earth and the people living on it. Thank you. Hello. So. I'm Paloma, like I said, and in September of 2019, my friends and I were inspired to participate in the worldwide protest against government inaction in regards to climate change. 
Um, the protests were styled after Greta Thunberg's Friday for Future School Strike for Climate Initiative, in which um, young people walk out of their classrooms on Friday um, in protest against the global inaction on climate change issues. Um, however, our school administrators, while supportive of the overall mission, suggested we explore and propose a more permanent approach to our environmental activism um, that didn't include skipping class. Um, and the administration gave us an immensely powerful platform for our change by promising to support whatever plan we develop to advocate for climate action. Um, so through collaboration with my classmates, we organized an extremely successful clothing drive for our community. And we planned other things, other strategies, such as a waste reduction week. But it unfortunately never came to fruition because um, the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic moved the school online. So while impacting my community by donating clothing items was inspiring, what I found the most motivating was the support and trust our school administrators had in our power as youth. Um, they believed in our ability to make change and gave us the time, space, and resources to implement our vision. And by doing so, they empowered us in the same way that you all in the audience can with the young people in your life as well, um, by giving them a chance to use their voices and guiding them along the way. My awareness of the impacts climate change had on my community started with noticing the mushrooms that were growing out of the wall next to my seat in my seventh grade biology classroom. I would later learn that the school building was originally built in 1935 and was never intended to withstand the increased rainfall, temperature, and humidity brought by climate change. The lack of updated infrastructure led to mold growth and other unhealthy conditions pleasant in my, present in my classrooms. Shortly thereafter, my classmates and I were removed from the room and we were put into a library multipurpose room where we would spend a significant portion of the remaining school year. Our district was not particularly forthcoming about the condition of our classroom, or the rest of the school for that matter, nor did they educate us much about climate change. So with the help of our incredible biology teacher, we did all that we could to educate ourselves about climate change and its impact on our community and advocate for policies that protected our health and well-being. We became our own advocates. We created and gave presentations to our local officials, as well as collecting signatures from uh, several of our community members. Our hard work eventually culminated in the passage of a Virginia state bill requiring mold testing and remediation, as well as parent notification of the results. Although it is wonderful we passed this bill, it should not have happened. In no world should any student ever have to teach themselves about the side effects of a toxic substance growing in their school buildings, and then advocate to officials for a healthier environment for themselves and their peers. Ensuring that no other students have to do this starts with changing our curriculum and teaching about climate change. Hello everyone, my name is Ren once again. And when I was about five or six, I had one of my first connections to nature. I started planting a garden in my backyard with my mom. This helped to spark my love of nature and help me to make more connections with others who share the same interest as I did. And as I grew older and learned more about our beautiful planet, my desire to preserve it grew stronger. And by the age of 10, I joined a variety of environment related programs to learn more and to do my part for the environment. So one program that I joined was the San Antonio Mayor's Youth Council run through the nonprofit EcoRise. It was through this program that I learned the most about climate justice and its relation to so many other issues. After this incredible experience, I took it upon myself to inform others on the actions they can take to help protect the environment. I also do my best to live sustainably and always consider the environmental impacts of my decisions. I've stopped shopping at fast fashion chains and thrift in my local community and shop at small businesses instead for over a year now. Additionally, instead of buying harmful cleaning products, I make my own using essential oils. Connecting to nature at a young age brought me so much joy and helped me to learn more about combating the climate crisis, which has ultimately shaped me to the person I am today. As we educate more of the youth of today, we continue to become stronger in the fight against climate change. Hello, my name is Nicole Romero. As a military kid, I have the privilege of moving across the United States with my family. Through my travels, I've become hyper aware of the disparities related to climate injustice and how a zip code can truly affect your quality of life. This sparked my interest in climate change and climate injustice. 
I became a member of Youth Engagement Council for Climate Initiatives and interned with EcoRise, the Texas Butterfly Ranch. I believe that education and engagement and exposure is the true path to change. And when we come together and prosper youth voices, we can change the world. Thank you. In the seventh grade, I was given the opportunity to do something about the school that was crumbling around me. Mushrooms had grown out of the wall of my biology Our school, but schools all across our state, by passing a bill that required schools to test and remediate mold that is found in their buildings. I used to be very nervous speaking in front of large groups and had no idea how much impact my voice had. I joined the Girl Scouts when I was in the fifth grade. This is where I realized that I was interested in environmental justice and the climate. At first, we started off with simple activities like cleaning up parks and areas around the community. Then we co connected everything. Cleaning up the park did make it look prettier, but it also reduced plastic waste and pollution, which did help the environment in the long run. These connections helped me understand the importance of keeping the environment clean for the future generations to enjoy. Girl Scouts was the was the spark that made me want to learn more about the climate crisis. So I decided to apply to other programs that focused on that. That's when I found the Mayor's Youth Council and EcoRise. EcoRise has taught me so much more about the racism and discrimination that is associated with the environment. I am now more aware of environmental injustices such as redlining and anti-homeless architecture. In addition to this, I was able to work on a project that focused on food security and co um, community health, which made me realize the environmental differences within the city. For instance, the north part barely has issues with food and their life expectancy is slightly longer than the south. By educating myself more on issues like this, I want to use my voice to help fix them and make a, the world equal for all regardless of color or in. Hi, I'm Mylea, and for most of my life, I lived in Europe where the approach to climate education was very different to what I've experienced at schools in the US. In Europe, and more specifically, Germany and Italy where I lived, we were required to recycle and keep our school campus clean. In many classes, climate change and how we use our environment were talked about often. It was the norm and something that was expected of you. Coming back to the United States and Texas, for me, was really weird. At my new school, it was not required to recycle or compost, and conversations about the effects that we have on our Earth didn't happen. I went from being required to recycle and know a little bit about the earth to basically not having to really do anything at all. And so I think that educating young people like myself, no matter what school that they go to, is really important. Having these two different experiences showed me that we can all be from the same place and live in the same place, but not have the same views on climate as the person next to you. I think that to make a change, we have to make it an urgency to better educate ourselves and those around us about how we can make that change. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sadie again, and <clears throat> I started working in the climate activism space when I was 16. Um, so when I was a junior in high school, my best friend and I learned about a statewide styrofoam ban that was working its way through the Maryland General Assembly. And I was specifically drawn to this bill by the immense waste that I saw in my Baltimore City public school system. Every day, over 80,000 styrofoam trays went into trash cans in cafeterias across the city. Not only that, but when researching the bill more, I was distraught to read how styrofoam leaches carcinogens into hot food and releases harmful fumes when incinerated. I had eaten off of these styrofoam trays since kindergarten, accumulating these toxins for over a decade. In response, my friend and I launched Baltimore Beyond Plastic, a youth-led organization dedicating to solving the issue of plastic pollution in our city. I taught Baltimore public school students about the dangers of styrofoam, led workshops to build their advocacy skills, and planned rallies. Mobilizing nonprofits, students, and Baltimoreans, our team took to the streets. I surveyed small businesses, explained what the bill would entail, and collected signatures in neighborhoods across the city. I also helped set up meetings between council members and students passionate about banning styrofoam. 
Six months later, we had organized hundreds of students to rally and testify in the hearing room as the bill was debated. City Council President Jack Young spoke before the vote and said, it was the students here who convinced me. I asked them questions and they came back with tough answers. They were really educated and knew what they wanted to say. That was my segue into the climate and plastic world. And I currently serve as national reinvestment chair for the College Climate Coalition. And I coordinate with a group of students across the United States and even in Canada around institutional investment in climate impacted communities. We recently launched a 55 page resource guide um, to support student campaigns um, in calling for institutional investment in under-resourced communities. Students can create change and it's instrumental as educators that we work to support them. Thank you. Now that we've given you some background information on this issue and shared our personal experiences with environmental justice, we want to give you some solutions to incorporate into your work. Inspiring and working to increase the percentage of youth, people, and marginalized communities who participate in the climate movement is a gradual process. We recommend these criteria to encourage young people to be more involved in the environment and community. To successfully help young people, we can educate, connect, and engage. Yes, like Ben said, um... We, once we present these different solutions, we want you to mix, match, and choose which solution works best for you. First, we must educate young people. To get students excited about participating in this movement, it is crucial that they have background information like we gave you today. Here are some solutions that can help you educate students. First, you can try to integrate a class into, classes into your curriculum, like an activism class or an environmental elective, such as AP environmental science class. You can create an environmental fair, kind of like a science fair, for students to explain how different aspects of the environment are being negatively affected. And you can include a spirit week of environmental activism, including courses, presentations, and activities. Also, you can host a contest where students may present potential solutions for environmental problems to a panel. The winner from the fair may receive a grant from a nonprofit organization. So that, their, so that their solution can be implemented in their school and community. Finally, outside of school, try to start an environmental justice club for interested students and plan activities such as school field trips, lectures, and speakers. So for the connect part of this framework, we wanna encourage you to create a relationship between young people and their community by holding events that connect everyone together. This allows for young people to spread their impact and find others in their community who have similar views and whom they can learn from in a way that feels less academic and more personable. Fostering this connection between young people and their community creates a bonded group of people with aligned views on climate and climate justice. This in turn encourages more people to become involved in the movement. An effective way to ensure that the whole community is involved and that there are no barriers for attending is to make, um, make sure that the actual event is free to the public. By making these engagements free, you ensure that people of all different backgrounds are sharing their perspectives and learning from everyone else's. Some community event ideas could be trash or beach cleanups, having a community garden or even a neighborhood garden or um, holding virtual community climate discussions. Those are just some ideas, but of course, since many communities are not the same, Teachers, students, and community members should take into account their community's perspectives on climate change when holding these events. In terms of engagement, um, educators can take a number of steps. Um, host field trips and nature walks for your student. Students host Earth Day assemblies, aside novels and movies incorporating the issues that we've discussed here, and host discussions about climate change more broadly. Right now, you should be seeing a ending poll question show up on your end of the screen. The question is, how will you plan to advance climate change education and equity? Will you integrate climate change and activism topics into every grade and subject curriculum, provide low barrier and engaging activities for the school community, foster student relationships with the community through free, accessible, engaging events and discussions? engage students in climate change policy decisions and discussions, all of the above, none of the above, or something other than the above.
Wow, 38% of you said all of the above. 9% of you integrate climate change activism topics. Another 9% of you provide low barrier and engaging activities. 18% foster student relationships with the community through free, accessible, and engaging community events and discussions. 11% engage students in the climate change policy decisions and discussions. And 40% of you said something other than the above. Wow, sounds like we're going to have a bunch of climate change related activities incorporated in classrooms and education. And this concludes our presentation for this conference. Now, if there is a Q&A option at the bottom of your screen where you can place your questions that you have for our panelists. Thank you so much for listening to the youth of today. All right, we'll just get started with some of these questions. I'll start with the question I see first. The energy here takes me back over three decades, like a time machine where I can see myself as I now see you here now. What else can you share with us older kids that will continue to give us hope over the next three decades? I have faith in all of you and would love to be able to see the future with all of you staying on pathways to measurable, powerful, and lasting change. Thank you so, so much for your question. Okay. Um, I guess we'll have some of us answer this question like per person. And why don't we start with whoever I see on my screen first, Jaya, for the question. The question is, what else can you share with us older kids that will continue to give us hope over the next three decades? I think like the biggest thing for me is just knowing that adults like believe in us and like actually will listen to our voices. So something that I found really helpful when I first started off is just reaching out to like government officials and just honestly trying to connect with people and share like what I'm passionate about and how I wanna make change in the later years. I feel like that's something that has really inspired me as I'm starting to grow up and finish up high school. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of hope for us and it's so nice hearing from all these adults that really like trust our opinion, but yeah. Love that answer, Jaya. I totally, totally agree with you. Okay, next question. With college on the horizon for many of you, do you intend to explore science, climate, or sustainability degrees and clubs? And Bridget, what do you think? Um, I actually could not hear that question. I was seeing other notifications popping up in the chat. What was... Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, with college on the horizon for many of you, do you attend, intend to explore science, climate, or sustainability degrees and clubs? Um, yes, I do. Um, but I'm still only a, I'm a rising 10th grader, um, but I do plan, there is, <laughs> there are environmental activism clubs at my school and I plan to start one up as well uh, with, my with my student organization standing for tomorrow. Um, but actually I was going through the Thing, and I noticed a question that came in earlier. Uh, it was, what are some challenges you have faced in your work and how are you working through them? Uh, I noted that because I wanted to answer just because it's, it, I don't know. I don't know, people don't always think about this, but sometimes getting the adults in your community to listen to you and take you seriously, especially as a young person, it can be really, really difficult. Uh, and so a lot of times we had to do a lot of extra research and convince people and convince people to take us seriously before we could convince them. Uh, that what we that the issues we were facing were a problem. Love that answer, Bridget. Okay, next question. Do you have any tips on getting through to stubborn parties, be they political leaders, school administration, and other disinterested parties? Paloma, would you like to take this question? Yes, so what I've learned from having to talk to my own administrators to get my stuff done and teachers when I had to form clubs was that you need to, when advocating for what you're passionate about, you have to also step into their shoes and realize how is this going to benefit them? I feel like the environmental issue is so broad, it can be tied to anything, economically, politically, um, culturally, it really just depends on who you're talking to and what what their expertise is, what they care about, and make your issue about them too, and relate it to them so that it feels personal. So that's what I had to do. And obviously, as a you know a, a really young person, it's 
I have limited experience with what other people care about, like when I'm talking to professionals, but as professionals in the audience talking to other professionals, I could see that going a lot better, honestly, because y'all are more exposed to um, the different careers and the professional world and how things work out there, which I haven't been exposed to that much, but that's what I would say. Great answer, Paloma. I love, love that. Okay, next question. Do you have advice on getting student buy-in? What got you motivated to spend your limited time on this topic instead of being apathetic? And Ben, would you like to take this question? Um, sure. Uh, let's see. Let me, there we go. All right. Um, so my advice to really um, get student engagement is to make um, make what you learn in the classrooms, not just learning to prepare for a test. I want you, uh, it, it's good to apply what you're learning to real life examples, real life activities. And I think that that really helps um, engage the student and makes them realize that what they're doing, even at a young age, can impact what they do in the future. Um, so I think it's really all about applying what you learn to real life scenarios and just having that, um, that just sense of something beyond the classroom. Great answer, Ben. I love that. Definitely, we need to incorporate stuff that goes beyond the classroom. Okay, uh, next question. Will you address obstacles you overcame when trying to change curriculum to include climate science? I heard some or approaches district-wide or by your individual schools. And why don't we have Mylea answer this question? Um, for me personally, I haven't overcome any obstacles in changing the curriculum, but I know that um, there's a lot of like school leaders and school like officials who don't want to add that climate curriculum. And I think just um, just trying to convince them and like maybe even like educating them more on the climate crisis um, can be really helpful in getting that into schools. Totally agree, education is a powerful tool. Okay, next question. And I want to ask Viva B and Nicole this question because I think it's a great, great question. How can we host virtual community climate discussion from the Banin to join the powers and voices as well? So Viva B and Nicole, whichever one of you would like to go first. Um, I can go. So I think um, the main thing about hosting a virtual conference like this um, for climate would have to be um, the people that you choose to invite. So if they're not interested in it, then maybe um, the virtual conference could be geared towards um, persuading them. But if it's like you guys, a group of teachers that are really passionate about bringing change, then we can make it more towards um, information and the ways we can um, take that spark and advance it more. So I think it all just depends on the audience. Uh, I like to add on that. Uh, it's also engaging people who don't know or really aren't that educated and having spaces accessible to all like students or just people who do not have that background. And um, just having this online space is really amazing because it's not just in a building or a city, it's anyone can access it. And I think that's amazing. So thank you. Great answers, you two. Okay, mm, next question. Can you think of a mentor, teacher, or leader who supported you and your work? What did they do to positively impact your journey as a climate activist? And Sadie, why don't you take this question? Sure. Um, I'd like to thank Andrea Calderon, um, who was a Green Healthy Schools coordinator in Baltimore City for really being instrumental um, in supporting this work. I think as an educator, it's wonderful your students are, are self-motivated and excited to tackle these issues but they any resources or networks that you can point them to um, are really important in helping them like tackle the issue head on um, so leveraging your existing resources to help support them yeah great answer sadie i love that Awesome job, all of our panelists. Thank you so much for answering these questions. And this concludes our Q&A portion. And thank you so much to everyone attended. We appreciate you all.
And thank you very much to the panelists. Um, you have inspired reading through the comments. You've inspired all of the educators. So kudos to you and thank you very much. Um, I hope you're joining us and staying with us for the rest of the day. Take care.